At the beginning of the 20th century, a major shift took place in science. Scientists started doing experiments with unprecedented precision, fiddling with single particles, atoms and electrons. And they got scared. Well, maybe not so much scared as confused. Small objects seem to have fuzzy properties. Sometimes they behave like tangible things, and sometimes like waves. What's more, the very act of observing them, of measuring them, seem to bring them to life, excavate them from a vague, esoteric domain. It seemed that, for some mysterious reason, those little objects were brought into being only thanks to the gracious look of an experimentalist. It was an intellectual revolution. The equations of the new science, quantum mechanics, were beautiful, mathematically appealing. They generated astonishingly correct answers for mind-boggling questions about the exotic micro-world. You see all of this? This is Deepavali, one of the most important Hindu festivals. It's celebrated all over the world. The basic understanding of this celebration is the victory of good over evil, light over darkness. But of course, like with every spiritual celebration, there is much deeper meaning to it. So in fact, the Pavel is about the acquisition of the highest state of knowledge about the universe and reality. Of course, it has nothing to do with science. After all, it's just a spiritual celebration. But it bears a striking resemblance to what happened at the beginning of the 20th century. And what happened then was the birth of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is one of the most important and most precise theories ever invented by humanity. Our modern technology relies on it. But of course, technology is just a spin-off. Science is not about engineering, it's not about technologies, it's about understanding of reality. And indeed, quantum mechanics gives us a very precise and thorough understanding of the inner workings of the universe. However, there is a price we have to pay for this understanding. It was almost an age ago that reality vanished for good. It was annihilated by a group of ruthless geniuses from Europe. So who banished reality from this new physics? Who is responsible for removing it, for making it persona non grata? One man. One man deserves the credit and one man deserves the blame. Niels Bohr. A towering figure of Danish physics, very influential. Someone who shaped how physicists, how a generation of physicists think about the meaning of quantum physics. Measurement is not really 
a big deal for people who grew up with uh, classical perception of the world. It just uncovers pre-existing properties of the object. If something does exist, we can see it, and measurement just reveals what is already there. If you see something red, obviously it was red before. If you see something white, obviously it was white before. But it's not quite the case in quantum physics. For Bohr, things exist, the outcomes of the measurements do exist, they form part of reality, preparation is part of reality, but not anything in between. So I take a coin, I put it here, and then I look at it. This is the act of the measurement. So now it's real, I can see whether it's heads or tails, that's the outcome of the measurement. But is it real now? Is it heads or tails? You don't know. Einstein found it really appalling. For him it was thoroughly unacceptable to think about physics in those terms. The fact that there's no reality, that there are things that can happen without any reason, that didn't make sense at all. In fact, Einstein said several times, you know, I would rather be a cobbler than a physicist in this particular case. It doesn't make sense to me. Albert Einstein knows very well that reality is a subtle thing. In order to talk about reality in scientific terms, you have to define it. You have to be quite clear what you mean by reality. So here is a coin, and suppose this coin represents a quantum object. You have two different properties of this coin, heads and tails. Heads, you look at it, it's still heads. Tails, you look at it, still tails. The act of looking at it doesn't disturb the property you're looking at. Even though Albert Einstein is not entirely happy with quantum physics, he is going to point to one peculiar, bizarre quantum phenomenon, quantum entanglement. And he's going to use this phenomenon to show that you can attribute an element of physical reality to quantum objects which are not directly exposed to your perception. Quantum entanglement means that you can create two identical objects. Keep one of them hidden from your perception and look at the other one. You know that those two objects are identical, so if you see a certain property of this object, this object that is hidden from your perception will have identical properties. Heads, heads here. Tails, tails here. There is a little bit of a problem with this. For Einstein idea to work, we have to make sure that we can learn the value of the physical property, and here we have quantum entanglement, without disturbing this value. We want to make sure that if I perform a measurement here, this measurement does not affect in any way the coin that is miles away. In order to do it, the other coin has to be really as far away as possible, so there is no time for the signal from this coin, when I perform the measurement, to reach another coin. I'm going to ask my twin brother to travel miles, miles, miles away from here, to another part of the world, and he's going to carry a coin that is entangled with this one. When I perform a measurement on my coin, looking at it, and seeing tails here, I know that there's no time for the signal to propagate from here till there to affect the value of the coin that he's holding. So here we are. The element of physical reality is established. Even without looking directly at his coin, I know what is the value of the physical property he's going to see without in any way disturbing this value. Although reality might have seemed to be tentatively regained, it wasn't quite the case. There were some substantial problems with Einstein's idea. He wrote it down in 1935, supported by Nathan Rosen and Boris Podolsky, but most of his colleagues decided to reject or ignore his thought experiment. 
and he, even he himself, rather feared this kind of explanation. If quantum physics allows such a propestuous, spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called quantum entanglement, if this is the only way of bringing elements of reality into the world, then the theory must be faulty or unfinished. That was Einstein's point of view. But he didn't know how to make this new science complete. And his paper waited whole decades to be truly understood and tested in a lab. So we have Albert Einstein and we have Niels Bohr. Reality versus, I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it exists, maybe not. Don't ask, shut up and calculate. Typical Niels Bohr. Now, moving on to the 50s, we have a few other individuals who try to make sense of both views, who understand that quantum physics, as it is, is extremely powerful as a mathematical tool to make predictions, no doubts about it. 1-0 in favor of Niels Bohr. But at the same time, it makes sense to ask something about reality. It makes sense to talk about things in terms of their real existence. So, one point in favor of Albert Einstein. Can we find a way in between, where we combine both? Enter David Bohm, an American physicist who finds the orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics unsatisfactory to say the least. He is trying to make sense out of its undeniable predictive power, and at the same time, he wants to bring some substantial elements of reality into it. Bohm is looking for some underlying, true, more real reality, and he comes up with a perplexing, elaborate model where we have particles, but we have also pilot waves that guide those particles. The model somehow reflected a twisted mind, in my personal view, of David Bohm. A very complex, a very interesting character who was expelled from the United States because of his allegedly communist views. He was also known to be in perpetual search of something deeper, something more profound. David Bohm was operating on the fringe of the society. He was different, he was unusual. He went always where physicists wouldn't go. So this is the world that David Bohm eventually ended up, of deities, of gods, of spiritual characters, something that is far removed from physics, as both Einstein and probably Bohr would like to see it. Bohm's theory was terribly convoluted. Any particle's trajectory, any photons or electrons' fate, depends on the configuration of all other particles in the entire universe. It complicates calculations a bit. A huge bit. So, in trying to rescue reality from non-existence, Bohm made it unappealingly complex. After David Bohm, we have another interesting person who says, well, I can actually make sense out of einstein gedanken experiments. I can translate those experiments into something that is experimentally viable, something that can tell us whether there is an underlying physical reality associated with quantum objects or not, whether they have properties like heads or tails when we don't look at them, or not. And that person is John Bell.
John Bell looked quite harmless, but he was a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of physics. He was a talented particle physicist working in the Nobel CERN and a quantum rebel by night. He insisted on looking for a better, more complete quantum theory, more harmonious one. But how come he was so different from his colleagues? He was of proletarian background, this may be part of explanation. Maybe it was his, his Irish temper that didn't show up very often. In fact, on an everyday basis, he was quite a mild person. However, he could become furious when it came to discuss with other physicists the meaning of quantum physics. And the reason is because most physicists had never thought about this question and thought it was meaningless to ask about the meaning. They just were happy with shutting up, calculating, and getting predictions. And those who were trying to think about the meanings of quantum physics, in fact, uh, ended up attributing a godlike status to the observer that Bell could not accept. Tell me about his famous inequality. So John Bell knew that in quantum theory, you can only predict probabilities. Quantum theory doesn't tell you anything about what's going to happen on a, on a single measurement. It will tell you that if you do many measurements, let's say 40% of them will give a given result and 60% of them will give another result. That's all you get from the theory. Bell was not happy with this. He thought that physics should explain what happens every time in each single event. And he realized that this assumption can be tested by taking the probabilities that quantum theory predicts and arranging them in a, in a sum and difference of them in an inequality, in a sense. It sounds terribly technical. Can you make it simpler? Imagine two kids in a park like this one. We put them in two different locations where they can't see each other, and then we ask them to play the following game. If each kid sees a man, he has to raise the right arm. If he sees a woman, he has to raise the left arm. So we play the game with these kids, and the kids will play the game and succeed at it, find it fair, because it's easy to do. Now, in order to explain what quantum physics does and what puzzle Bell, I have to modify the game. Now, suppose that I ask these two kids that whenever both of them see a woman, one of them still has to raise the right arm, but the other one has to raise the left arm. The kids will not find this game fair anymore because the second kid doesn't know how to behave if he sees a woman. He has to receive the information from his other friend. And the way, of course, to solve this problem with kids would be to provide them with mobile telephones and then the first one calls the second and tells him if he has seen a man or a woman. All right, but it's just a game. How does it translate to real physics? So the first game, the fair game, is what John Bell was hoping for quantum theory. Namely, that whenever you make a measurement, the measurement here would be man or woman, the kid, the quantum object, knows what to reply. It's already written there, it's pre-existing, and just the, 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 the physical object has just to show the, the answer. The second game, the game in which communication is needed, is what quantum physics seems to do. However, there is a problem that there is no communication in quantum physics. Quantum objects do not have mobile telephones. So this is entirely puzzling. This boils down to what already Einstein spoke as a feared, in fact, an explanation through a spooky action at a distance. So it's really ironic, because it seems like history is repeating itself. Like Einstein, it was Bell who was in the end wrong. Bell, at some point, uh, insisted that correlations cry out for explanation, that something must be explained. And he ended up proving, against his own desire, that the only possible explanation would be the spooky action at a distance. Bell was hoping by his deep thoughts to falsify the dominant view of quantum physics, the mainstream view of quantum physics, and to reconstruct a more harmonious view of the world according to our everyday vision. And at the end of the day, he proved himself wrong, yes. John Bell came up with his famous inequality in the late 60s, and the reception was rather lukewarm. Can you tell me why? It was probably not lukewarm, but people weren't really aware of its impact because it was a very mathematical and abstract uh, concept, so it didn't really translate directly into an experiment you could immediately carry out. So it was the doing of, of John Clauser and Abner Shimony and Mike Holt to, to translate that and actually test in a, a realistic physical system. I think John Clauser was sort of a, a bit of an outcast uh, of, of uh, not a standard physicist, but he was very determined to, to carry out such an experiment uh, for real. I heard that the machine he created to do this experiment was a real monster. Uh, definitely that would fit um, uh, John Clauser's character. I heard him once saying that um, if you are not uh, 
well, if you, you cannot build an experiment like that out of a piece of junk, you're not a real physicist. And that more or less must have uh, been reflected in, in the way he set up that experiment in the basement of, of uh, that Berkeley lab. What was really driving him? Because John Bell inequalities were, you know, as I said, too abstract to, to deal with. People were not really accepting this, um, this concept of entanglement at all. I mean, they, they all believed that like, some collapse of a wave function was, is going to take place and we don't care about the details. And they didn't really see um, that, that it can actually carry out an experiment and, and, and show that this is not the case. Clauser was a hippie, a natural-born nonconformist. His intention was to perform an experiment deciding whether nature acts spookily at a distance or it doesn't, whether reality exists objectively or is created by the act of measurement. The result was quite ironic. Working closely with Abner Shimoni, a great philosopher of science and also a physicist, Clauser proved what he thought he would refute. Spooky action at a distance this weird, provocative thought invention of Einstein's, derived only in order to expose quantum physics incompleteness, seemed to be common in nature. The final outcome of this experiment was a bit unconclusive, uh, in a sense that, that it didn't really convince a lot of people in the community that, that, uh, that he really proved or disproved uh, the, the prediction of, of quantum mechanics. Um, that is probably a, like also attributed to the fact that, that it was carried out in, in with, with very limited resources. And then after that came this uh, French guy? Alain S.P. and Jean Dalibar, yes. They was about, uh, uh, well, a, f a few years later, um, early, uh, early 80s, late 70s, um, where they set up an experiment that, that really tried to um, do a clean experimental uh, test of these Bell inequalities. It must have been very fascinating to have an experiment that was directly testing what Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen envisaged many years before. It was testing what reality is really about. That's for sure, and that, that uh, reaches out to a much larger community perhaps than, than the, the previous uh, successful um, moments of quantum physics were, was able to do. It was certainly not the first time quantum physics was shown to be a very convincing uh, description of nature, but it's a description of nature that touches on people's perception of reality. Quantum physics was gradually becoming intriguing again. It was turning out not to be merely a bag of tricks. And then a certain group of mavericks came and made it even more sexy. You see those two inconspicuous gentlemen? One with a bottle and the other one in a hat? They did it. They are masters of quantum theory. In the 80s, they discovered the unthinkable. I was uh, swimming. We were both at a conference. Uh, don't say that yeah, yet. Okay, okay yes. <laughs> Just pulling. <it>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was swimming uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, minding my own business, when this complete stranger here swims up to me and starts telling me, with no provocation on my part, that he knows how to use quantum mechanics to make a bank notes that are impossible to counterfeit. Um, that was a bit shocking. A uh, life-changing experience, actually. Uh, by the time we swam back ashore, I had found a way to improve it. I approached Gilles because he was on the program with a talk, which was uh, about cryptography, and I thought he would be interested in this sort of thing. But you had spotted me at the, um, at the reception because of my name tag. For some reason, it didn't approach me then. But since you can recognize faces when I was in the ocean without my name tag, you still knew it was me. Um, whereas You uh, had a big beard then, I yes, think. Yes, right, right, right. What Charles Bennett and Gilles Brassard discovered was a cryptologist's dream. The sender encodes the message into states of photons. The details of the process would probably kill your attention in a moment, so let me tell you only this. An eavesdropper is helpless when faced with this method of encoding. However he tries to listen, whatever he does to conceal his presence, he fails. Any act of eavesdropping disturbs the delicate, 
quantum states of photons and gives the intruder away. It was difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. We, we, we presented it in, uh, in a, the first place we presented it was in the San mm -hmm. in, in a conference north, north of Montreal. We got it accepted there, but, but uh, after being rejected from many places. Well, we gave a talk, and one of the big experts in the field, yeah. whom I won't mention his name, but he is now, the, the uh, ironically, the head of a quantum information lab, <laughs> uh, said that basically he understood all about optics and this made no sense you know there was no such thing as some channel that you couldn't that you could could uh, that could be used to send secrets because if you eavesdropped on it it would disturb it so he said we, you know, so he, he was he, he doubted us and we stuck to our guns and then Gilles had some friend who was looking for a a, a talk and a paper to be given at a conference in Bangalore, India. And he invited me to give a talk on whatever I wanted. Uh, <laughs> and so I took that opportunity to sneak in something that was rejected from everywhere. Otherwise, um, he didn't know what he was getting into. But it, 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 it just became extremely highly cited paper, yeah. and d despite appearing in a very obscure place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until the 70s, cryptography was based on a very simple procedure. Encrypting and decrypting of a message was done by means of a cryptographic key. The key was a string of random numbers, which when applied to a message in a certain way, closed and opened it. The message could be sent publicly, on a postcard, in a letter, or even published in a newspaper. The tricky part was handing the key, which is supposed to be secret. An ingenious American mathematician, Claude Shannon, specified the conditions for the cryptographic key to be perfectly secure. First of all, the key must be absolutely random. Secondly, the key must be as long as the message it is going to encrypt. Thirdly, the key must be kept perfectly secret. And finally, the key must be never reused. But there is a catch. How to pass the secret key around? Of course you could use another secret key, but that's a vicious circle. This is why the keys are distributed by life-risking couriers. The revolution started in the 70s, when the new cutting-edge technique was invented. It is called public key distribution. It sounds self-contradictory, but it works. It is based on two keys, the public one and the private one. The public key is used to encrypt the message and the private one to decipher it. The whole thing is based on a very special mathematical functions that are easy to run one way 
and difficult to run in reverse. Even if you use all the classical computers in the world to crack the message, it will be too long for you to be of any practical value. So all the online transactions and your credit cards are perfectly safe for now. Classical computers that we know so well explore laboriously one possibility at a time. They perform one calculation after another. They go bit by bit. Quantum computers are quite a different story. Computing machines made of quantum components are like this Hawker Center. At first sight, they might look chaotic, unpredictable and noisy. But overall, the whole thing works perfectly well. And when you design it smartly, it might do magic for you. Of course, it's very hard to tell you exactly how a quantum computer works, but one of its properties is that you can imagine that where a normal program, you give it an input, it computes the solution just for this particular input, but a quantum computer in principle can compute the solutions for all inputs at the same time. In a classical processor, um, or like parallel processing, you are basically really just duplicating the same program over and over again. So I take a program, I make a copy, I run it on a different machine. In quantum computing, you basically take all these machines together and you just have one machine, that in parallel computes 3 plus x for all values of x. Suppose that tomorrow somebody has a working quantum computer, Mossad, KGB, or CIA for instance. Mm. What's going to happen to the world? Will it collapse? Will there be some drastic changes? Well, it depends a bit how paranoid you are. But if you were paranoid, then there would certainly be quite a few dramatic changes. Because there are in fact some problems where we know that it's easy for a quantum computer to solve them. Namely, determining the prime factors of an integer. We believe that um, if the integer is very large, then it's very difficult for a classical computer to find its factors. So difficult means that for a classical computer it takes a very long time to figure out what these factors actually are. So maybe you're saying, why do I care? Why is this, why is this relevant for me? Um, so a lot of cryptographic protocols rely on the fact that it is difficult, it takes a long time to figure out what are the factors of a large integer. A quantum computer would allow me to break the encryption and, well, gain your credit card number. So maybe you're saying, well, that's all okay because I'm never going to use my credit card ever again. But it gets even worse. So even retroactively, I could break encryption schemes. So if you have some secrets, I don't know what you have stored on your hard drive, um, I could use this quantum machine, this quantum computer, to break the encryption that you have used yesterday and figure out what secrets you store. We already know about Charles Bennett's and Gilles Brassard's quantum cryptography protocol. But there was someone else, the third quantum prodigy, Arthur Eckert. Unaware of Bennett's and Brassard's work, he invents his own quantum key distribution method. Eckert's idea is even more crazy and, as it turns out, reaches well beyond quantum physics. 
It was a rainy afternoon in esteemed Oxford when young Arthur Eckert entered the Clarendon Laboratory Library. He reached for the forgotten publication of Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen. The paper was a snapshot of Einstein's state of mind at that time in 1935. The old master was struggling with himself and with a dull interpretation of physics imposed by Niels Bohr. He wanted to understand, really understand nature, not just to calculate its weird actions. There was one sentence that attracted my attention. If, without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. This is how Einstein wanted to define reality. For me, this was a definition of eavesdropping. For me, it was a statement whereby an eavesdropper who wants to read information can do so without disturbing a physical system. So physical reality and eavesdropping became equivalent. So then I was thinking, okay, if I can in any way set up an experiment where I can show that there's no element of physical reality, then I can also show there's no eavesdropping in the system. And what came to my mind was a sequence of experiments where you have highly correlated entangled photons with polarization. So you have those two photons that come from a source and they propagate into two different locations, one to Alice, another one to Bob. And when in transit from the source to those two locations, the photons do not have a well-defined polarization. You cannot say what is the value of this polarization here and there. Of course, when polarization is measured at the end, it has a value. But what was shown later on by John Bell, that there is a way to certify, in fact, that there's no way to attribute polarization or element of physical reality to those two photons. So therefore, if there's no way to attribute physical reality, there's no way to eavesdrop. And that's it, you know, that was a beautiful finale that somehow brought element of physical reality to the deep and profound issue of secure communication to the key distribution. And that was this connection, that, that a very surprising connection between the foundations of quantum physics on one hand and the open problem in secure communication. Now the truth is that um, there's no equivalent to entanglement, there's no equivalent of this kind of correlation in classical world. So now we are talking about a completely different kind of security. We are not talking about someone not being able to calculate something. We are not talking about someone not being able to say whether information leaked the system this way or another. We are talking about security which is based on the laws of physics. Something that is just there, you cannot change it. No matter whether you are smart or not, no matter what kind of computational power you have. There's just no way you can break the system because the laws of physics are as they are. In classical cryptology, the key exists objectively. It is something concrete that has to be taken care of. In the quantum case, the cryptographic key does not exist prior to the measurements. This string of zeros and ones, string of information, the little piece of reality itself, is born out of some timeless and spaceless void.
what in the 60s, 70s and even 80s was pure abstraction, an abstract theory only, in the 90s became reality, whatever it is. Lasers became ubiquitous. Manipulations on single photons, electrons, ions and particles became much easier. Now all those exotic quantum ideas found they are embodiments. You can even play with entanglement in your living room, really. You can encode zeros and ones onto states of small objects. All these gizmos we use every day, phones, tablets, computers, GPS modules, they wouldn't exist if not for quantum mechanics. And the whole wide and vibrant field of knowledge emerged from the obscure publication of Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen. But the question remains, is reality out there or isn't it? Is it created out of puzzling quantum nothingness by continuous acts of observation? Is the science we know capable of dealing with such big questions? If not, perhaps it is because it is not the final theory. Hard to believe that it is our last word, considering it's questioning the existence of reality, the problem of measurement, its counterintuitive assumptions, its inherent randomness, the odd status of free will. Some scientists say that quantum mechanics is like, like a boat. More precisely they say it's like a leaking boat. You can patch it here and there, but it takes water anyway. I think, Doug, the analogy is, uh, is good and bad. Um, it's probably bad because quantum mechanics has been extremely successful at explaining all sorts of phenomena. Um, so we know from the tiniest particles to the, to the biggest objects in the universe, quantum physics gives um, predictions that are completely verified by experiments. But I think it's a good analogy in the sense that we still really don't understand what quantum mechanics is telling us. And every time we think we come up with a good uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, there is always a small place where this leaks. And I think in that sense the, the leaky boat analogy is very good. What I always found unusual and weird is really the fact that it seems that things out there don't really exist. So wait, 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 wait. so uh, I remember Einstein once said that according to quantum mechanics the moon doesn't really exist when you don't look at it. What do you think about this strange statement? I think he was probably over dramatizing there but I think what we understand now is that is that objects like atoms we cannot talk about their properties like position or the speed at which they go unless we really set up an experiment to test one of these particular features. Basically we have to set up an experiment where we measure the position of an atom and only when we get a click in a particular position we can say there it is, it's located here. And otherwise if we don't do that then the atom is really spread out everywhere and we can never really meaningfully talk about, about its properties. And I think if you now extrapolate this to Einstein's statement the fact that the moon is made up of, of lots of atoms, you can say, well, so does it mean that we really have to keep measuring the moon in order, in order to, to claim that it's really there? I wouldn't go as far as, as far as Einstein to claim that the moon is not there if we humans don't look at it. But I think certain environment and certain interaction with the environment seems to be needed to define the features of the moon as well. 
So do you think that we should look for some other theory that would be more intuitive to us and would replace quantum mechanics? Quite a few revolutions have been driven really by, by the need for new technology. I think we have it in this field because, because there is quite a lot of competition to make quantum computers. And of course, these would be um, information processing machines that fully utilize the laws of quantum mechanics. But I think also what you need is to encourage uh, more blue skies um, research. You need to encourage more people to take quantum mechanics outside of the comfort zone and maybe look more actively for these areas of disagreement where you can see that you might have to go beyond what we understand at the moment. You are looking for areas of disagreement? Thinking about stepping out of the comfort zone? You don't have to look very far. Here is an example. Remember Artur Seckert's idea for the perfect cipher? He suggested that for sending cryptographic keys, we can use entangled particles, these strangely correlated photons or electrons that act as one, whatever distance separates them. Eckert's discovery has a truly unexpected and intellectually challenging twist, which was surprising even for him. It seems to go well beyond what we understand at the moment. Will it spark the third quantum revolution? So we talked about quantum cryptography, how the basic laws of physics can guarantee security. Now let's make another step. Quantum cryptography based on entangled photons is secure not only when you use a particular set of devices, but when you use any devices that can generate certain types of correlations. It doesn't matter whether you use entangled photon, in fact. You can use any devices of any type, as long as you can get certain types of correlations which are strong enough. Then you adapt. You can achieve perfect security. There's one extra ingredient that is necessary for that. We made this tacit assumption that we are free to make certain choices when we operate devices. This is the notion of free will. A philosophical concept per se, it plays a significant role here. So if I were to summarize it in two words, what makes this security really possible? There are two ingredients to it. Quantum correlations and free will. Bring them together and you have something unbelievable. Perfect security. Each subject is helping each other to understand certain issues better. Cryptography is asking you, in fact, not to be too instrumental in your approach. It's not good enough to use mathematical formulas just to say, there is a such and such chance for this to happen and this to happen. It is really asking a question about, well, do you understand what's going on? You should, because if you don't, it might not be secure. Unfortunately, there's a certain business model for doing physics. When you just move from your undergraduate days, you go to your PhD, to your postdoc, you get a job, you have to conform to a certain way of doing things. You just sit down and make incremental progress. You write papers, you have them published, you put them on your CV, and at some point you have a happy existence as a young academic. It's good. I'm not saying that it's not okay. I mean, it's fine, but for a revolution to happen, you have to just deviate from this path. You have to go somewhere where you can ask significant questions. You can just be different. You have to be different. You have to strive to be different, ask questions. The first quantum revolution in the early 20th century has demolished the notion of reality as we know it. It separated us, observers, from the external world we are submerged in. It erected a wall between micro and macro world. It left us without a map that outlines the boundaries between those two domains. Now we are stuck in the borderlands. The second quantum revolution in the 70s, 80s and 90s neither saved nor killed reality for good. We need the third one to clear things out. The third quantum intifada. In 
In traditional and still prevailing scientific vision, we are always aliens. We always disturb the subjects we investigate. Like in old times, when usually condescending anthropologists used to invade Aboriginal tribes of Africa or South America, trying to deduce some kind of objective knowledge about their customs and psychology. But they usually failed when it came to the details, because they themselves became part of the subject observed. So maybe, knowing that, we should incorporate ourselves, observers, participants, in the new quantum vision of reality. Perhaps we should extend physics to embrace life, us, maybe consciousness. Hey, why not the whole universe? Maybe to go beneath the surface of ordinary things, to touch the very fabric of reality, you need to forget about yourself. Maybe you need to forget about the science you have been exposed to for so many years. As Master Yoda says, you have to unlearn what you have learned. Damn! But how do you do it? La da 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 da